Welcome, everybody. Great to see uh, the serious turnout of this talk. Um, we're going to talk about open banking a little more, even though I won't be talking about open banking as such, but I would like to look at some of the security aspects as have been dealt with by open banking. So we'll kind of get back to the question that you just asked about authentication and then see whether we can actually leverage uh, the standards that are being used in these open banking in initiatives for a much wider application. Because at the end of the day, we may all be involved in APIs, developing APIs, uh, and we may all need to apply um, security uh, to those APIs. So that's what we're going to do. My name is Olaf, Olaf van Gorp, or at least that's whom I pretend to be. So you've got to trust me for that. And I am with RogueWave Software. And within RogueWave, I work with the Akana API management platform. Um, I'm very happy that um, I can talk here about API security today because it's, it's one of the things that I'm pretty passionate about. And I am especially pleased that I am allowed to do so in this particular room. Because this particular room, as you may know, is dedicated to a uh, very extraordinary person that you may know. It's Ada, Countess of Loveless, or Ada Loveless, as most people uh, may know her. And this was a woman that was way ahead of her time. right? So she's attributed to kind of have written the first ever computer program or something that comes very close to it. Now, that is something that is pretty widely debated, but what is not debated is her pretty strong vision on computing devices and what these computing devices were offering in terms of capabilities and what they are not offering in terms of capabilities. So one of her very famous quotes from 1843, mind you, uh, kind of translates as that, in her opinion, computing devices will never be able to really come up with anything original, so they won't be able to think for themselves. Right? So essentially, they just respond to what is, what's been given to them, what's fed into them. And now I think that quote in itself may definitely be challenged at some stage, I mean, with the, you know, the upcoming of, of artificial intelligence and all that. But I think at this point in time, it's still very much true, which means that if you translate this in terms of security, that what we should aim at is to avoid uh, feeding stuff into our computing devices that would have these devices respond in, a, in an unwanted manner or a harmful manner, right? So the response that could result into anything like data leakage or data corruption or perhaps even data uh, destruction, right? So that was just a, a little tribute to uh, Ada Loveless. Don't ever forget that name anymore. On to API security then. So API security in itself, I, I always find a little bit of a, you know, of a contradiction in terms. So on the one hand, with, with APIs, especially public APIs, we like to kind of open shop, right? We want to introduce as many people, as many consumers as we can to actually make use of what those APIs are offering. But at the same time, we also very much want to uh, protect the resources that have been accessed through these APIs, right? At least I would do. Um, so uh, you can imagine that um, as with a real shop, uh, you would be very happy to have many, many customers. But at the same time, you would not be happy if these customers would just walk out with your precious resources. right? And it very much applies to what we, what we do with APIs. Now, in the real world, we have kind of come up with all kinds of means and measures to make sure that that kind of doesn't happen, or at least is under control. Right, so anything from like passports and identity badges and uh, turnstiles and, and what have you, right, to protect those precious resources, which applies to shops but also to our own homes, right? Even though from experience I can tell you that applying this particular thing in your own home uh, doesn't really work. It does, but you know, it leaves the room pretty cold, uh, as I found out. Now, in the digital world, uh, there's something similar, right? There's a whole lot of, uh, of open standards there. Um, you know, laid down in all kinds of RFCs, and they tend to address specific security concerns and how you can effectively deal with those concerns. So what you can do to kind of make sure that that concern is no longer a concern as such. Uh, and that's, that's fantastic. Uh, but from experience, I know that it's also pretty overwhelming, right? I mean, there's, there's a pile of those RFCs. You may have to go through them. Uh, it's, it's not usually an easy read. Uh, and then you're, you still have to implement all that. So you still have to come up with a decision as to what am I going to apply in order to effectively deal with what security concern. 
right? And I know the majority of us is probably happy to do so, but I myself tend to be rather lazy, so what, what I tend to do is to kind of look at uh, stuff that's already been done, right? I mean, you know that there are situations where people really give some thorough thought as to how to most effectively deal with a problem, like here, the good people of idea, in this case. Um, so, you know, why, why, why don't you just try and leverage that? So, in the course of time, I came across a whole number of specifications and they were just being referred to uh, in the previous talk, uh, in the open banking domain. Um, and I thought that, that was a good place to find some, some decent inspiration. Um, so, I've been looking at, at some of these open banking and PSD2 specs in detail, but first I'd like to explain why, why these in particular. Um, and the first reason for that is that obviously these specifications, they target security, API security, um, for APIs that deal with, with very sensitive data, or at least that's how we tend to look at them, right? Financial data, payment transactions, our own bank accounts, right? We'd rather have them safe and only accessible by, well, ourselves essentially. Uh, so sensitive data. Then the second bit is that uh, a number of these specs are actually the result of some kind of regulation, which means that the, the organizations implementing those uh, specifications, uh, like uh, the banks in the UK, like the financial institutions in, in Europe, uh, uh, following PSD2, <coughs> excuse me, um, it means that, that implementing those APIs is not really a voluntary exercise. Right? They need to provide an API interface and they need, they must provide uh, a very secure interface. PSD2 is very, very explicit about what you need to do in order to, to get your API safe. Um, which also means that if something happens, you know, they will be held accountable. Right? Government authorities will come after them and make sure that, well, um, that they explain why happened what just happened. Um, Another important bit, I think, is that these specifications are actually the result of some, you know, some pretty careful work. So I've seen in the UK, for instance, that there's quite a significant number of workshops that a large number of uh, stakeholders participate in. So people coming from like the financial institutions, but also from tech vendors, uh, from the governments, um, a lot of brain power uh, brought together. So you can imagine that what these people came up with is, is pretty significant. Right, so and if all that is actually laid down into a specification, wonderful. Let's have a closer look, let's see what we can use um, uh, of that. And last but not least, I thought to mention it is that uh, these specs are actually applied to systems that are running in production. So it's not just an academic resource uh, or, or an academic exercise. Um, these, these specs are actually protecting APIs as we speak, right? They're securing APIs at this very moment. So in terms of uh, the specs that I've been looking at, I, I just picked these three. They're pretty common, I think, in the European space. There's certainly more, um, but I think these make sense. So there's the open banking uh, spec that's created by the UK Open Banking Implementation Entity. Then there is Next Gen PSD2, created by uh, the Berlin Group, a uh, pan-European organization based in Germany, as the name suggests. And then there is uh, PSD2 API created by STET here in France. And so I kind of looked at these specs from, from a bit of a, of, a, of a higher level, if you will, higher vantage point, and then I found that they all share a pretty common ground when, when it comes to API security. So they essentially um, use a bit of a layered approach to security. So they do stuff at the transport layer, uh, they then go on to do more advanced client authentication and authorization, and last but not least, they have very specific requirements regarding message security security at the message level, at the request and response level. And the way they do that, I don't expect you not to be aware of this at all. Um, transport layer, mutual TLS, is what they all come up with. So it means really certificate-based client authentication, which is kind of used as a means to, uh, to authenticate the client, but perhaps also the channel, the device, right, at the transport layer. Then the second layer is more advanced or detailed client authentication and authorization in particular, for which they all kind of recommend at least uh, an OAuth 2 approach, probably with OpenID Connect on top of that for resource owner uh, authentication. 
And the last layer is interesting because here the UK Open Banking spec is very, very explicit. They really use the, uh, I mean, they really mandate the use of JSON Web Tokens, signed JSON Web Tokens, uh, which is a pretty common standard nowadays, I would say. Um, but the Berlin Group and SDET, they, they, they seem to be in doubt a little bit. So they refer to a spec which is called signed HTTP messages, which is actually a draft specification, uh, which kind of has the same objective as what we can do with JOT. Um, yeah, it's in draft and it actually expired last month, so I'm not exactly sure where that is going. So it may very well be that both Berlin Group and STET also start looking at the use of uh, signed JOT tokens at some stage in the future. Because it, w it would actually also satisfy the use case, I think, in terms of what you want to achieve uh, in security terms. Um, yeah. So what, what all this about? What all this is about is that we at least can ensure that each incoming request is coming from a trusted source. Um, NTLS, OAuth, JOT, right? With that last bit focusing on message integrity, so that that, that parcel that's coming in uh, can I actually um, see that it's coming from the sender that I expect it to be coming from. Right? Is it is it is it not ripped open? Um, is what is in there? Is that actually does it contain the signature of the person that's uh, supposed to have sent that message to me? Right. That's that's the kind of stuff we do with uh, with your tokens. So I've I've tried to kind of put that in the inevitable diagram. So this kind of shows what what is going to happen in terms of API security if you would access uh, an API. So this example shows it's implicitly a bit of a confidential client, right? So the client wants to access the API. It then first needs to go to an authorization server to receive the access token. Um, may use mutual TLS to access the authorization server. May also use a JAR token as an alternative, right? A JAR assertion uh, to authenticate itself. And if all that is fine, then the authorization server will return the access token, which can then be used by the client to access the actual API, which again may involve mutual TLS or may uh, require mutual TLS, right? So already at this point in the story, we may deal with two, potentially even three certificates, or at least, you know, key stores. Uh, at this stage, we may actually also already deal with two different JAR tokens, or perhaps even three different JAR tokens, right? So there may be the JAR assertion going to the authorization server, then there is the access token, which may be a JAR token, and if you're using OpenID Connect, then the ID token is also a JAR token. So just think of that also in terms of implementation, right? What it would mean to get all that working properly. Uh, last but not least, uh, once the connection is authorized and the message can actually be received by the API, that message itself uh, may then have to be wrapped as a JSON web token. So the UK Open Banking spec, like I mentioned, they're very explicit about that. They, in fact, prescribe the use of a non-encoded detached JSON web token, which means that the payload, the message payload, is not encoded, it's not base64 encoded, and is sent detached from the rest of the JAR token, which is kept in a header, right, sent with the message. So it still allows the receiving party to verify the signature, the signature across, that, uh, across that message. So that's all, all very good, and I think that if, if we have implemented that properly, if we have followed the spec and, and done all these steps, then at least we can be fairly sure that what is coming in at the end of the day is something that we can vouch for that it's coming from, uh, from the originating sender, right? And that it's, uh, that is a message that, is, um, uh, that has not seen its integrity violated and all that. Is that sufficient? The things that we have not yet touched on is, of course, uh, the person that's sitting behind the application, right? The user. Do we already know who the user is? He or she. And more importantly, do we know the intentions of that user? So even though the application may be authorized, even though the user may have been authenticated and authorized, even though the package may have been signed, that, of course, doesn't stop me or you from putting something into that package uh, that can still cause uh, unwanted behavior uh, at the API or the service that the API exposes, right? I can still um, inject something. Um, I can still 
um, try to do some SQL injection, for instance, or some JavaScript injection. Um, in terms of user authentication, and this is something that is a little bit beyond, or you might say in front of the API layer as such, uh, all of the specs require some kind of strong customer authentication, multi-factor authentication. Right, so, and I think that is, that is highly, highly recommendable. So at least you know that that user is, is a valid user. Right? It's actually the resource owner that is authenticated. We can vouch for that identity. But that again, it doesn't stop that identity from doing something uh, malicious. Right? As we all know. See? That's so very nice. Conclusion. Five minutes. Um, what was my conclusion? So I think the conclusion of the whole story is that API security, there's, there's quite a lot to it. Right? It's, it's not a trivial exercise at all. If you really want to secure your APIs, then there's a whole lot to look at. And uh, it's, it's kind of um, interesting that in the open banking domain, especially in Europe, it's very much uh, mandatory. So the implementing partners are really forced by governance to do what they do. But I wouldn't be surprised if you see that spread out to other domains as well. So there will be a time, rest assured, where any public API that provides access to data um, sensitive or not, will need to be protected with these kind of security measures. Right? GDPR is, is already a precursor to that. Right? There is a very strong focus on, on getting those or having those data uh, protected. Fortunately, a lot of useful specifications that already kind of take the parts of all of these RFCs that are applicable. And um, yeah, of course, I, I have to end the talk with, with saying that Please do not do this yourself, right? It's really way too complicated uh, to, to kind of write your own code and deal with OAuth and JORT and, and all of these validations. There's excellent stuff out there in the market that's there to help you, including, of course, the stuff that I'm representing here. And that's, um, that's about all I wanted to share with you today. Uh, the last thing I should mention, of course, is that uh, if you're really interested in this stuff, and if you're interested to see in how we do it with the Akana platform, then you're most welcome to the workshop this afternoon. I'm not sure if there's still a uh, possibility to register, but if so, please do. And um, otherwise, come and visit us at the booth, and we can, uh, we can talk some more. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>